live now, and we welcome all of you this morning uh, with us, as always. And some of you will be catching up with us later in the week, and that's good. We're just thankful that uh, you can have that, that opportunity. And I uh, want to give a special shout-out this morning to one of our own, Lee Peavy. Lee, uh, I know you're listening. If you're not right now, you, you will be soon. And uh, Bubba Wayne loves you. And uh, this church loves you, and you're dear to us, and we just we long for the time when the smoke is cleared from all of this uh, virus mess that's going on, and you can get back in this church with us, you and your mama, and uh, and we're praying for, for, for Keith White, of, of course, too. And uh, this is one of the most beautiful hymns I, that there is because because of what it what it what it says. I love to tell the story. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of Romans, chapter 4. Romans, chapter 4. I oftentimes refer to this book in the Bible 
as the constitution of the Bible. This, uh, this book of Romans, if you want to really know the in-depth uh, tenets of, of Christianity, this book of Romans, it will, uh, it will, it, it will spell it out to you. My, my uncle H.S. Rycroft, y'all hear me mention from time to time, he, uh, when, he, when the Lord saved him, up, uh, I believe he was living in Thomaston, Georgia then, uh, he, could, he could not even hardly read, read in, uh, or write, write his own name. And the Lord saved him, and uh, his wife, my Aunt Maggie, she worked with him. He, he literally, as he learned, the, he, he learned to read, uh, reading the Bible. And uh, wow, isn't that something? And uh, boy, did he, did he love it. He, uh, he, had, he had just about memorized the whole entire book of Romans. You could not quote a verse that he couldn't hardly tell you what chapter and verse it was, or if you mentioned well, Romans, Romans 8, 38, he could, he could quote it to you. He always said, if there's, if, there's, if, there's, if, there's just one, if there's just one book out of the 66 that you, that you can have that you're going to concentrate on, let it be the book of Romans. Uh, let's read there in the fourth chapter of Romans, verses 16 through 25. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. I want to say that again. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. I want you to think about this morning with me. I want to talk to you this morning about faith being the key that unlocks the door to grace because it literally is. It literally is. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. What he's saying is no one is excluded. Jew and Gentile alike will have free access to this. 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before, whom, before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. He's talking about Abraham here now, Abraham's faith. 18, who against hope believed in hope. We have to do that sometimes. That he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Every time you see that, thy seed should be, that's me and you. That gave us the opportunity. 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah, his wife's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed or counted to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for Abraham's sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. My goodness alive. As much as possible, men and women, let's, let's, let's try to put ourselves in Abraham and Sarah's position this morning. Be a hundred-year-old man, your wife, somewhere well into her 90s, near a hundred, and God, God, t God tells you he's going to bring you and her both back to potency and fertility and she's going to conceive and birth a son. And from this son, the offspring will be blessed and favored above any people to ever walk planet Earth. They will multiply so greatly that their numbers will be as the stars in heaven and the grains of sand on the seashore. And God will bless those who bless them and curse those who curse them. Now would it be harder to believe that or believe what Jesus asked Lazarus' sister to believe? John eleven twenty five. 25 Jesus said unto Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Abraham had to take God at his word. 
just like you and I have to. Just like you and I have to. The last two weeks of sermons have been, been, been compelling proofs that this Bible is just what it says it is. We've seen science. We've seen medicine. We've seen history. We've seen the unity of it. How 66 books make up the one book we call the Holy Bible. How 40, at least 40 different men from 13 different countries, three different continents, continents, speaking several different languages over a period of 1,600 years, wrote all of this, and it came together, none of them knowing what the other was writing, and it come together in perfect union without any con contradiction. Just, just so, how many times has it been said? How many times have I said it? It's so much easier to just take it for what it says and, and, and believe it than it is to try to rebut it. See, faith, as we see there in verse 16, faith activates God's grace. Look right over in the next chapter, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Faith, justification, grace, and hope. Let me tell you something. When you get surrounded in that, when you get saturated with that, when you get wrapped up with those things right there, it's hard for this world and the devil to do anything with you. It's just hard for them to handle you then. You know, oftentimes he's going to say, because what is a bully? As we've, as we've said many times, the devil is the bully of all bullies. What does a bully want? He don't want a fair fight. No, you know, you've seen, we used to see that on the schoolyard. You'd have a bully, you know, he'd be done pushed around some boys he knew, he knew, he knew he had the advantage of, but oh boy, then when one, when one that he was pretty sure could handle him and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him would stand up by him. He wasn't so eager to fight that guy. Isn't that I mean, Can I tell you, the devil's the same way. And don't ever forget, when, when, when you are a child of God, when you are a born-again Christian, the Spirit of God lives in you, is sealed in you, and God said, greater is he that is in you then than he that is of this world. Don't forget that. Hold on to that. See, the devil, the, the devil may have more power than, than, than we got, but we got a lot more authority than he got, than he's got. Praise God. Put him in his place. Put him in his place. But faith activates God's grace. The moment we're saved, we're adopted into the family of God and are covered with God's umbrella of grace. Verses 17 and 18 now where we read. What sounded impossible, Abraham believed it anyhow. Why? Because God said it. That's why he believed it. Because God said it. <clears throat> I stopped by a few years ago by uh, my brother and, and Reverend Winfred Huffs over at Haynesville. He raises those day lilies. And I mean, that's just his, that, that's his, uh, apart from, from, uh, uh, preaching and teaching God's word and his family. He loves, that's his passion is those day lilies. And he was knelt down out there and in, them, in, in those and I'd gone by to visit a lady who was dying of cancer and late, later, later did, did pass uh, that was in our former church. And I started back by and I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't pass by without, without stopping and speak, speaking to him. And, and uh, you know, he was not aware at the time that my cousin Alan Buchanan had recently passed. And, uh, we talked about Alan's childlike faith and we surmised about just what we could accomplish for the kingdom's sake if we Christians would really, really just completely take God at his word. And our Lee Peavy that God made so special. Uh, I, I, think about, I was thinking about Alan as I was going over, over, over my message. He, he and Alan, as I said at Alan's uh, funeral, uh, if Alan had never... Uh, 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 bought in, bought into the Christian thing. Alan would have still made heaven, just like Lee would have. But, but, but how blessed and how, how beautiful, how beautiful, you know. Alan and Lee, they've got that childlike faith. You know, think about you know when a child is growing up with a, with a loving, trustworthy mother and, and father. You know, shoot, they, they'll do. If you tell that child to, to jump, jump off in that hole, they'll jump off in there. It's that, it's that un, unwavering trust that, that God, God wants us to have. Mm. 
Folks, you know as well as I do, our nation is decaying morally and spiritually right before our very eyes. Because more and more of the population reject the instructions and principle of this Bible. 20% put no stock in it, give no credit to it for anything whatsoever. Only 20% absolutely believe that it is, it is the infallible, perfect, literal word of the living God. So that means a 60% kind of float. That's those casual and carnal Christians. The carnal, there's three levels of, there's three levels of Christians. Is your carnal Christian? He get he gets he he he, he has a time and, and and he 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 genuinely I believe calls on God to save him and he does save him because God said whosoever shall call on him, call on him, he will save if they'll confess. But but then but then he but then he lets that world and the stuff and the lifestyle draw him draw him back out there. And then you got your casual Christians. They just you know they don't they don't want to be. We don't, we don't want to get crazy with this thing now. We don't want to go overboard with this Christianity now. Somebody might call us a holy roller. Oh, wouldn't that be awful? What a compliment, amen? What a compliment, that's what it is. You know what a Jesus freak is? That's somebody that probably loves him more than you do. That's what a Jesus freak is. Goodness gracious. But my, 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 we see you know, a few years ago, the, the, the senior Duck Dynasty man, Phil Robertson, boy, he created a firestorm because he quoted scripture concerning homosexuality. See, Roberts, Robertson's biblical view on the sin of homosexuality was immediately met with disdain from the intolerant gay community and its vast network of immoral liberal allies. A&E network immediately almost suspended. But huh, it wasn't long before they wanted to reinstate them. Mm-hmm. Because they were about to lose a ton of money. Because they found out there's a bunch of folks, there's a bunch of folks in this country that like that Duck Dynasty and what those people stood for and lived for. I, I heard uh, a little while back Phil Robertson was was uh, he was invited to speak to the uh, to the to the lawmakers in uh, the state of Nebraska, and he talked about sin. This was before we got into this this lawless time we seem to be in now in these big cities. But he said sin is lawlessness, and the Bible says that it is. Sin is lawlessness. He told him. He said you can't forget God. Every nation that has forgotten God has gone to ruin. Has failed to ruin. And I love this. He said, there is no downside to loving God and loving your fellow human being. There is no downside to that. How many things do you know of that there's, 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 there's no negative? You know, we, we talk about, my grandmother used to talk about things, life, things in life being bittersweet. She said, no matter how sweet it was, there was almost going to be a little bit of bitterness attached to it. Not, not loving God and loving, loving your fellow human being, there's not. The greatest, the greatest force for good that will ever be. Love. Love. Now back to Abraham. The father of faith. The model of faith. Verse 19 there. Let's read that again. And being not weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Abraham didn't get bogged down about he and Sarah's physical condition because if he'd have focused on that and took his mind off of what God, God, God said, he, he would have just scoffed at it all. Well, you, you, remember Sarah, you remember Sarah laughed. You remember back in, in, in Genesis when, when, when God told him, you know, he was going to send him a child and... and and Sarah laughed, and, and, and God said, you laugh. Then she lied about it. She was so ashamed that she had. She said, no, I didn't. He said, yeah, you did. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you laughed. We'd have probably, a lot of us would have laughed, wouldn't we? Brother Jeff, you and Miss Robbie, y'all ain't a long ways from Abraham Sarah's age. What, what, if, 
What if, what if, what if God, what if God come to you and you and in a dream told you you and her was was fishing, fishing to have a, have another baby boy? But I believe I know you well enough to know that if you believe God told you that, you'd believe He was going to do it, wouldn't you? Amen. That's what Abraham. That's what Abraham did. He believed it because God said it, and that settles it. You hear people. You hear. You hear a lot of time that 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 it'll, it'll, it'll get that out of order. God, God said it, and I believe it, and that settles it. No, it don't matter whether you believe it or not. If God said it, that settles it. If we got one eye and half sense, then we'll believe it, and we'll be so much better off for it. I'm here to tell you all this morning, he didn't get bogged down about him and Sarah's physical condition. Your mind is a wonderful gift, but listen to me now. That blood that flows through it is opposed to the blood of Jesus. That blood that flows through me and you, it's opposed to that blood of Jesus because the human psyche, the human, the human spirit, not Holy Spirit, the human spirit, the human psyche is opposed to miracles. The human being is all about things that you can touch and feel and smell and hold on to. Tangible, tangible things. That's, that's the greatest tangible thing of God that we'll ever have on this earth right here is his word, is his word. And that's why it is so precious. The, the first six words in verse 19 tells us that Abraham was a practicing believer. He was a practicing believer. He did you know, we've all seen it, folks. Folks, folks will get, folks will get, they'll, they'll come in here and they'll get gloriously saved and they'll go out the back, the, the back door, and and don't, and all of a sudden don't come back to church and you know they'll get back out there just like they were before. You know that's what, and that, and that man, I don't know that there's anything troubles a pastor like that does like that. That just that breaks your heart. You know they got saved. You prayed with them. You seen the conviction on them. You 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 felt and saw their heart. And in that world, and, and, it, and it's, a, it's a lure out there. It'll, it'll, it'll draw them back. It'll draw them back in if they don't stay in the shadow of that cross. He was a practicing believer, believer, not casual, not passive. He was proactive. He was proactive. We never know what we may have to deal with tomorrow. Do we? Hmm? Back there in late February, early March. A virus, a pandemic. We've heard we heard about uh, epidemics, but a pandemic that's literally going to cover planet Earth and the last one of those maps I saw saw of the whole entire world. The United States is more covered and saturated with it than anywhere else on planet Earth. You, you think you think you think God may be trying to tell the United States a little something? You reckon he might be? You know he is. You know he is. Hmm. So we better stay charged and ready. I'm going to slip this in here. If you were on trial, if you're being tried for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Would there be enough evidence? Verses 20 and 21, we see the makeup of Abraham's great faith. It says, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Let me tell you something. There's something about that giving glory to God. I appreciate when people say kind things about me. You know, that was beautiful. You know, the, the story that... Uh, that the young writer with the Houston County Living magazine did, and the photographer and everything and all. Man, what 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 an honor and, and what a blessing! But I I, to, I told both of them, Debbie and I both, you know, don't we 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 don't want this about us. We don't want this about. Us. We want, as y'all heard me say before, and I believe this with all my heart, my heart. For some reason, God thought enough of us to let us help Him revive this old church. For some reason, enough. I don't feel worthy. I certainly don't feel deserving. I've never felt entitled to anything except a day's pay for a hard day's work. That's about all I've felt, ever felt entitled to. But there in verse 22, see, see, Abraham wasn't taken aback. He wasn't, he wasn't caught off guard. 
You got to remember God called him out of his comfort zone down there in Ur, which is what we know is would be southeast uh, Iraq, right down there near Kuwait. That's, that was Abraham's homeland. God called me, listen, it's one thing to be called in the missionary field. You're pretty sure you're going to go to a foreign country and your lifestyle and comforts, they're going to change somewhat and all, but you're going to probably have a way to get around over there. You're going to have a fairly decent roof over your head, and there's, and there's going to be food. He told Abraham, basically, just strike out, Abraham. I don't, I don't know if they had sleeping bags. I don't know what they slept in back then and all that and all. They had, they had some means of trying to keep yourself from freezing because, you know, it gets uh, it can get about as cold, it seems, in the middle of the night and no, over there in that, that country as it does hot in the daytime. But Abraham just went. God told him to go. Abraham went. But Abraham was an active, practicing man of God. And, 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 and this is important here in verse 20. He didn't start questioning God, but basically began praising him for what he was going to do. Listen. Just nail it down. Na nail it down right now that God has your best interest at heart. Praise God. God has our best interest at heart. Like nobody else. And who can do more for us than he can? Praise God. Verse 21 there, we see that Abraham was no rookie in his walk with God. He'd seen God come through over and over and over since he had called him. Just like you and I have just like you and I have. Think about another great man of God, a little later, little, the, the, one that wrote, the one that wrote this book, of, book to the Romans, in fact, the Apostle Paul. Paul said, I am persuaded. <laughs> Paul said, I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that to which I've committed to him against that day. What Paul was talking about, he said he was going to save me and he was going to forevermore save me and grant me eternal life and I'm persuaded he's going to do that. Are you persuaded this morning? If you're persuaded, use that persuasion on some of them people, people around you out there, out there in your life. So why do we panic and freak out so when things take a downturn? Because that's that human part of it. That's that human. That's that, that's that bull. That's that bulldog in there that, 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 that you know, he, he, want, he, wants, he wants to fight. He wants to have his way. He wants to have his way. The human spirit and the Holy Spirit in, inside a human body, that's what it's like. It's like two pit bulldogs just gnawing and fighting and groveling and carrying on. The one that's going to win is the one that gets fed the best. That's the one that's going to win. Feed your faith and you'll starve your doubt, slap to death. Starve them, starve them, slap to death. Hebrews 11, 1. Faith is the substance, substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now, I can, can I tell y'all I've been chewing on that for 34 years now? You can't get all of that. You cannot get all of that. It's like, a, it's like an old tough $2 steak. You just chew it and chew it and chew it. My daddy used to say we'd get one like that and he'd be so disappointed in it. He'd say, good gracious alive. I could, I could put new soles on my boots with this thing. It was so tough. <laughs> you know, but that word of God like that, you, we just chew on it and chew on it and chew on it and never get it off. Never get it chewed up. That's a good point. Never get it chewed up. Faith is the substance of things hopeful. That faith is what makes us hope. That's what, that's what makes us able to have that hope is that, is that faith. Mm, mm, mm. Doubt breeds panic and paranoia, doesn't it? That's what it does. That's what it does. Basically, doubt is putting faith in the enemy. When you give in to that doubt, you're putting more faith in the enemy than you are in God, that God can help get you through this and work this out. Capo, 
I remember some of them times. I won't ever forget some of them times after church. You, you, you just, you just, when the rug had so been pulled out from under you in your life, and you just, you, there was, there was no way, there was no way, physically, humanly speaking, right then, the way things looked right there, there was no way you could, you could, you could ever see any joy in life again. But I told you, just hang on, didn't I? That God hadn't forgot you, and 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 he's he's. He's, he's, worked, he's worked it all out pretty good, ain't he? Amen. You better believe it. He will. He always will. He always will. And oh, by the way, that baby that God promised Abraham and Sarah, that baby didn't come in nine months or a couple of years or five years or ten years, even 15 years, 25 years. 25 years. That means they was almost 125 years old then when the baby was conceived and actually born. Because it says they were, they, Abraham was 100 when God told them they was going to have one and it was another 25 years. But Abraham stayed the course. He might have stumbled, but he held on. How? Through faith. He had just seen God do so much that he, he just... You know, if God said that, I'm going to have to believe it. Because I've just done seen, I've just, just seen what he could do too many times. He held on. Verse, 20, verse 22 there. Let's read that again. Verse 22. And therefore it was imputed or counted to him for righteousness. That's the same exact thing that happens and takes place with a Christian when you become a Christian. The moment that you believe and you call on him, ask his forgiveness and welcome him into your life, it's imputed to you and counted as righteousness. Mm -hmm. He stumbled, but he held on through faith. What was, Abraham, what was Abraham's reward? Not land, not silver, not gold, but righteousness. Can I tell you, that's what a child of God ought to be seeking more than anything else. Righteousness. Jesus said, seek ye first my kingdom, my righteousness. And everything else will be added to you then. Everything else will be added to you. Seek that righteousness. And that's, see, that's what happens, see. We're not righteous. We, we cannot be righteous apart from the Spirit of God living in us. And that can only happen through submitting our will to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way we can have that righteousness. See, our sin separates us from a holy, righteous God. We can't stand before Him wrapped in our sin. That's what Jesus did for us. Well, you say, good for old Father Abraham, but how about me? Look back at verse 13 now in, in Romans 4th chapter. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. The faith is what brings us the righteousness. That clears being a Jew. Being, see, be, being a Jew, although they are God's chosen people, but being a Jew did not guarantee Abraham special favor from God. No, it didn't. It didn't do it. Just like you can have, and if you see it all the time, your, your mother, father, grandparents can be some of the most righteous people on earth, but that's not going to save you. That's not going to save you. And along that same line, a couple of months ago, this, this, this thing started coming out with all this civil unrest and all, you know. As I began to see, as I began to see people, some of, them, some of them with a lot of notori notoriety in the world too, famous people, apologizing for things they never did. God don't, God don't, Bobby Walker, Johnny Walker, Joyce, Jean, Benny. 
I don't have to repent for your sins. I can't repent for your sins. Y'all got to do that just like, I, just like I did did for mine. That's why he's such a personal God. Such a personal God. God is no respecter of persons. The playing field at the foot of the cross is level for all. The glamour queen, queens won't have an edge because of their beauty. The billionaires won't be able to buy it. The genius won't be able to figure out another way. What Jesus was talking about, John 14, 6. When Thomas said, how will we know the way? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh to the Father but by me. He's the way. He's the, he's the only way. Verse 24 tells the only way one can become righteous in the eyes of God. Let's read 24. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed or counted, we, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Over in the 10th chapter, of Romans, Paul summed that up, and that's probably the, ver the verses right there that are used more than, in than any ever have been uh, to, to explain uh, the plan of salvation and lead someone to, one to Christ. He said, if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead on that third day, if we call on him and believe him, we shall be saved. Chapter, I'm going, to read you this, I'm going to read you this verse right here that ties in so beautifully. Chapter 10, verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You know, Jesus said he didn't come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it. Jesus fulfilled the law. You and I, it took grace, it took grace for me and you to be able to have the life that we have. It took grace for us to have the peace of God and peace with God because it was impossible. The, great, the greatest men, even the Job's, even the Abraham's, Isaac's, Jacob's, Joseph's, Daniel's, they couldn't live a perfect life. And that's the only other way you can be saved and stand before a holy and a righteous God is to live a perfect life. But praise God, when we put our faith in Jesus and we accept him by faith, then God looks upon us. He says, because what happened, there was, I call it, a, a, the divine exchange takes place the moment that you believe. He, God looks upon the moment we believe in his son Jesus. God literally pulls out all that rottenness of our sins. And he sees that nailed on that cross with Jesus. And scripture confirms this. And he replaces that rottenness that has been in us from them sins. He replaces that rottenness with his righteousness. That's how then we can stand before a holy and a righteous God. Mm -hmm. well, you know what? No matter, no, no matter what's going on in our life, that right there, that right there above everything else, that ought to ensure that we're going we're gonna to still have a pretty good day right there. If you're a Christian, you're on your way to heaven. You are on your way to a place where there's no more problems. Revelation 21, 4 says, there'll be no more dying, no more crying, no more pain, no more sorrow, and there's no more sin. Can I tell you, when you wipe those five things out right there, that's heaven. That's why it's heaven. Not because it's going to have streets of gold and walls of jasper and pearly gates and all that. Oh, that's going to be something to behold. In fact, it's going to be so, it's going to be so awesome. We, we, couldn't even, we couldn't even look at the brightness and the, the, the glare and what's exuding from it with these, with these human eyes. But, but, but oh, oh, that knowing that we, we are there in a perfect land, 
And what's even better than that is, we'll be perfect. We'll be perfect. Never have another wrong thought. I love that one right there about there'll be no more sorrow. Is there anybody in here that hadn't said something, something to somebody you wish you could take back? You better believe it. And likewise, these people have said some things and done some things to you. You'd give anything if it never happened. There won't be no more of that nonsense. There won't be no more all that old trivial stuff. All that he said, she said, and you know, just all that drama and all that carrying on. Man, Lord, God, what is, oh, my goodness. Mm, 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 mm. God can't do more for you than giving Jesus, and me and you can't do no more than believing in him. God can't do no more for you. Give Jesus. I, I'll never forget. Er, early after I was called, it was in the mm, some of the first preaching I did. I was asked to preach one Sunday morning down at uh, uh, in Wilcox County, and I drove all night on Saturday nights in with the Atlanta Journal Constitution. I just barely had time to get home and. Uh, and uh, get cleaned up and get to that church. And I'm telling you right now, when I, when I, when I got in my car to leave there that day and felt like I could finally ex exhale, God spoke to me and he said, Son, you don't have to kill yourself. You don't, you, don't, you don't have to kill yourself because I can't love you no more than I already love you. And that was one of those epiphanies, you know, that you just, whoo, God, thank you for that. Because I, I just, I didn't want to tell nobody nothing. I didn't want to tell nobody nothing. If I was called to go and asked to come, you know, I, I just didn't want to tell nobody nothing. God said, you don't have to kill yourself. And you know something else about faith, too? How did I miss that? Yeah, great news about faith as we, as we close. You don't, need, you don't have to have an enormous amount of it because you got such a great big God. And in fact, he said, to put it in perspective, he said if you got faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, and that is a little bitty seed, that's a little bitty seed. But he uses illustration in there about that little seed, that particular mustard seed he's talking about there in biblical olden times would grow up into, in, into just a, a thing like a tree and just all kind of a flock of birds could roost in it. And he's saying, if you just got a little bit of faith, you pray for a mountain to be moved and it be moved. But you know, really, God ain't, God ain't wanting people to pray for mountains to be moved near as much as he's wanting some people that are just climb a mountain. Amen. That's what God needs. People that's willing to climb a mountain and not quit and not give up. That'll stay the course like Father Abraham did. In case you don't know it, the three major religions in the world, Christianity, uh, Judaism, the Jews, and, 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 and the Muslims all claim this man Abraham as the father of their faith. They sure do. That, that's, that's, that's the main reason for all the goings on over there, why they can't agree on who owns what and what the property settlements ought to be and all that is because they all claim ownership to it because they all claim, claim uh, Abraham. No. And you don't have to work it up. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry. Work it up and wonder, have I got enough faith? Because guess what? It's a gift. It's one of the, it's one of the spiritual gifts. Faith is.
And I'm telling you right now, I've been, I've been blessed to pray with many that, 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 that come to the foot of the cross and became Christians. And I've never yet, I've never yet asked someone, do you believe what this Bible says about Jesus and that Jesus went to that cross for you? I've never heard a person, and I believe with all my heart, at that moment, God has convicted that person and he's drawn them to him by his mighty spirit. And that, that, that they've got a, he's given them a measure of faith. And that moment right there, Tanya, un, unlike, unlike anything we'll ever, ever, else we'll ever know. I believe it out of my heart. And he seals them. He said he seals them then until the day of redemption. Praise God. Praise God. Miss Ann, I'm so glad you're here this morning as I didn't, uh, for the in invitation here. And as, as always, we're going to, uh, Miss Ann's going to come and she's going to play a, she's going to play a hymn of invitation. And, uh, if God's speaking to you this morning, it, it's real simple. If you've never called on Jesus and, at, and ask him to save you and, and, and put, put your faith in him, you need to do that more than anything else in your life you could possibly even consider doing. I lived my first 34 years without him, but I thank God he gave me 34 more now with him, and I can tell you right now, it's a whole lot better walking with him than opposing him. It's like when the Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul was on that road to Damascus, and you know, he had been a perse persecutor of Christians, stood by and watched them stone Steve, Stephen, and, you, and God, and God, oh man, I had one of those nights like that in the middle of the night. And God, God said, God spoke to him and said, Jesus spoke to him on that road to Damascus and said, he was, he was still Saul then. That before he changed his name to Paul, he said, Saul, why do you persecute us, man? Mm. He said, Saul, why do you kick against the pricks? It's futile, ain't it, Bob? It's futile. You're not going to win. <laughs> you, know, you know, in wrestling and boxing and football, you know, we, 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 we fight. We, we're taught and it's drilled in us. And, you know, that, 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 that eye, that tiger, and we, we fight to the end. And that gives us the best chance to win. But you're not going to win that. We're not, you're not going to win that fight, fight when you're opposing God and you're doing it contrary to him. If God's speaking to you here this morning in the church, as Miss Ann begins to play, come and we'll pray here at this altar. Anything you need to pray about. But above all, know that you know Jesus and the forgiveness of your sins and that you are under that. By faith, by faith, you have entered into that grace that he so wants to give everyone. Okay, Miss Ann. Mm -hmm.